Hi everyone, today we'll discuss the paper Geometry Processing with Neural Fields by Guan Dao. And if you want to join the reading group sessions yourself, you can do that every Tuesday and the information for all of it is down in the description. So what, uh, I, I, I can structure it in the following way. So this is basically the new slides I have for yeah. video. Oh, so it's really my honor to be here. Uh, it's really nice to see everyone. Um, so I can give a quick run through on the slides and I do prepare some um, uh, additional slides talking about uh, limitation, future works, direction that I'm interested in and two slides for discussion questions but uh, i i also see uh, you, i'm also happy to kind of just get, like take questions along the ways that i'm present um so and my presentation is mainly on two parts so i guess that's what um i guess uh, how about we start in this way and then yeah. uh or any question in the middle that sounds absolutely perfect all right then let's uh let's go ahead and yeah, maybe I I give the quick introduction with that we now today have Guan Dao Yang. I hope that's pronounced halfway correctly from Cornell. And he's presenting his nearest paper, Geometry Processing with Neural Fields. Yeah, and the floor is yours. Okay, sure, thank you. So uh, a little bit about myself. I'm currently a fourth year PhD. So my research interests are mainly on geometric processing um, with discretization free representations. Uh, this is one of the works uh, that I'm doing toward that direction. It's a collaboration with uh, Vladlin and my two advisors. Um, it's done during my internship at Intel. Um, so is um, the, let, uh, the top, I would just break it down into two parts. One is like the general idea. So this is a paper that is an advocation uh, for using neural fields as a representation uh, for geometrics. Like when you come to processing a geometric data, uh, we kind of think that neural field would be a pretty cool representation that you should try on. And uh, so that's the, about the first part about the general idea. And then the second part, I will take a deep dive into how how does this idea instantiate in as rich as possible elastic deformations? Um, and then the third part, as I mentioned, will be some discussion on limitation, future works, as well as discussion uh, question in general, like the general question that I'm interested in um, regarding the uh, this line of work. So, um, so I will just uh, maybe I can uh, jump start in the first part. Um, what is geometric processing? So in this work, we are mostly concerned in geometric processing as the, the manipulation of geometric data. So for geometric data, is basically any the data form stored in the computer that represent a shape. Um, so geometric processing has including like uh, um, smoothing the shapes, deforming it, and for example, taking it apart, uh, that kind of stuff. And this is a very, uh, has many application in industry. So just to mention a few, for example, if you want to design a pause to be used for industry, if you want to design a game and create a character within the movies, and they are all very uh, like important applications down the road. Um, so um, traditionally, most of the geometric process uh, algorithm kind of just take a, a mesh as the representation. So, Hany, so do you have a question? Yeah, kind of what are the uh, is this sounds like such a well posed problem and can we maybe have a quick introduction what are sort of the the, the difficulties here to do this and why <laughs> do you want to do anything with machine learning at all here isn't this an easy yeah. problem <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is some question that I will answer down the road. Um, so uh, maybe just a couple more slides, and then I will come back to the questions. So, uh, yeah. So um, yeah, actually, it's a really good question. I actually had it on my slides. So just a couple slides down. So let me. Uh, so when we choose the, we did. Uh, we need to have a way to represent geometric data. Um, so uh, one of the, the representation that we have to, that, uh, that people use all the day is mesh. Um, so the ways that mesh represent data is basically discretize the surface into a bunch of points and then they connect into a little bit of polygons. Um, so there are actually many uh, advantage and disadvantage of using mesh. Um, so uh, originally in the very first mesh essay created by PhD students, measuring the, the actual real cards and then enter into the 
um, the computer. So one of the advantage of mesh is actually it's really easy to understand when you see like pop it out in this way, you know what the shape is. Um, and it's very easy to, for the computer to get uh, access to nearest neighbor. So you giving me a vertex, I know what the nearby vertices are. I kind of uh, can envision what the local patch looks like. But there are also some trouble coming in, for example, uh, to change the topology of the mesh, it could be a little bit troublesome. For example, if you want to poke a hole into the uh, this Stanford uh, bunny, um, then then some of the things are broken and you need to fix it. And all the other thing is when we talk about placing points on the surface, there are good ways to place it and there are best ways to place it. You can imagine that uh, there are people that place really long triangles throughout the surface. Maybe that's not a really ideal way to the, put the points. So maintaining a good a surface discretization is also something that we need to keep in mind when we're processing a mesh. Um, so this kind of leads to your question. So uh, um, is there actually a good way to, uh, is there an alternative to the mesh when we come to geometric processing tasks, like uh, regarding topological changes and uh, then I don't need to maintain this discretization? Um, so one alternative is the, the implicit field. So the implicit field is represented uh, by a function that maps the ambient space to a scalar value. And then how does the shape represent inside the field? The shape is represented as a con uh, as a level set that evaluates the field function to a certain constant. Um, so here I plot out the Stanford bunny into the data set, uh, level sets, and that's the sh uh, shapes that uh, we're interested in embedding in this in the, um, implicit field. Traditionally, this implicit field is represent uh, is kind of stored in the voxels or a arc tree. And you can imagine, uh, you can see that that's a kind of like uh, it gets expensive and it requires some of the manual tuning in order to get the um, like the player storage uh, right. Um, there are recent works that try to use neural network to parameterize the field. So the idea is the neural network takes the spatial coding as the input and outputs the scalar value that's uh, yeah, that approximates the field value. So the network approximates the field function um, and there are many advantages of do, uh, things like this. Um, for example, it kind of inherits the good advantage of implicit field. So if you want to poke a hole into uh, in implicit field with the uh, with the uh, like change the topology of implicit field, that's pretty easy, and it's also easy when we want to change it with the neural field. So some of the uh, constructed solid geometry operations still apply here. And there are some additional advantage when we represent it with the neural network. So that it, so for example, neural network is kind of like really small and it allows some really high um, uh, fidelity. So uh, this compactness and allow the uh, arbitrary number of samples is kind of uh, something new advantage that bring in by the neural networks. So motivated by this advantage, uh, so in this paper we want to ask the question: Are we able to do geometric processing or the tasks that we're interested in manipulating the shapes entirely using this kind of represent, uh, representation. Like each shape is a neural network that represents the field function. So that's basically why we call, want to ask this question. And then I, I want to go back to the question, why is it hard? Why is the geometric processing task kind of hard questions? Okay. See the next, uh, yeah. Then before I get to that, if we get to that question, maybe the... yeah. Like just to make sure we got the neural fields representation right now. So we yeah. have just a network that takes coordinates, for example, two in, in this image, and then spits us out a single number. And then we represent the, a surface, for example, the red bunny here, uh, the, yeah, mm. the, the red shape. We represent it as the, the points, all of the points in our image, the x and right. y coordinates, if we call them that. Uh, that have the same f of x output, right? Right, right, okay. precisely. So the shape is a collection of spatial coordinates that evaluates a field function to kind of uh, account. Usually we just choose zero and level set. We'll also get to how uh, quickly how to how we learn this and mm -hmm. so usually, uh huh. Okay. Uh, so it's the question: How to change? Uh, how do we get the neural fields? Yeah, I just mean, does it come later or should we get into it now? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's a little bit. So usually uh, the neural fields can be trained on a variety of methods. So for example, 
um, nerve, per, they, they, you can view of it as a neural field, but they, they might not be exactly the types the, the neural field I'm using here. They can actually train it through differential rendering and, uh, and the supervision on image. So for example, the, they, for each of the neural field, they will choose a camera point, uh, coordinates, uh, like camera pose, and they render the image, and then they supervise uh, with the reconstruction law on the image. That's one way. The other way is like suppose you know some of the ground truth geometry. Um, like for example, if you know the, the surface point cloud, there is a way to supervise and learn the, the neural fields through just surface point cloud. So one of my pr uh, previous works on gradient fields, we derive a ways to um, the the parameterize the neural field as the gradient fields and that, that can be computed from the score matching function and and the most standard way is suppose you have a mesh you want to convert a mesh to a neural field in that case um, you will be able to just sample surface points and for each surface point you will be able to compute the ground to uh, for example in this case Sanderson field or the ground to occupancy field and then you use the L2 laws to supervise so okay. there are a variety yeah. yeah. For example, now um, we um, imagine like, to to learn this bunny uh, bunny representation mm -hmm. here. We could go ahead and uh, train our neural or not really train our neural network. We just let it remember. We're we're not really learning anything. We just um, use it as a memory function, so to say. We give it every single pixel of our image, and then mm -hmm. um, the network should remember. The distance to the to the surface, and I mean we have the ground truth surface, and we calculate the distance to the surface, and have the network outputs the the, the distance, and now we have the whole thing represented as this uh, network. Right. Or yeah. So the uh, memorization is actually a really good word. So I usually uh, view it as a compression process. The idea is that the network needs to remember all the data, which will be much more than the number of parameters, use uh, and compress it into the parameterization that they, the network use. So you can think of it as like this compress this huge amount of supervision into a compact network. Yeah. Like for this for this image, right? If we're not talking about pixels as the input domain, but instead of like uh, continuous space, like just R two as the image, then yeah, we're compressing basically infinite amounts of data to um, into our neural neural field or trying to. Um, yeah, like, infinite. I wouldn't say it's an yeah. infinite amount data but like this is basically the, the amount of supervision the neural network only have so many parameters so it needs to leverage the, the like try its best you uh, to compress the inf information that I provided into it so for most but of the time we end, don't it can spit us out um for for infinitely many inputs it can spit us out the the distance that it thinks the input would have yeah right Right. So, so once it's trained, you will be able to figure out infinite, like for example, yeah. for arbitrary inside. But, but it's also not infinite because we are running on some floating point precision anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> but, but really, a lot of input and output that's stored in this network. Okay, but I think it's clear what the what you mean with neural fields. We just remember something like, for example, the distance to a surface, and that way we have a shape encoded in in this. A neural network, a neural field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, good, really good question. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. So, um, so now, now I get back to your first question. So, um, so uh, suppose we want to answer the question: Are we able to do that entirely with a neural field? So it shapes as neural fields. Uh, the answer is uh, like we need to talk about the uh, the challenge of the the the. Uh, geometric processing task. So how does a ge typical geometric processing task looks? So they will usually take two sort of inputs. One is a input shape, so the part of the input would be a geometric data. The other part of input would be the user specific uh, user specification because the uh, in and then the output of the geometric processing task is typically that you need to manipulate the geometric uh, data in, uh, as from the inputs to something else that fulfill the user specification. So there are two, uh, so the idea is that you want to change uh, the geometric data or the shapes 
to look uh, to be something that the user wants you to uh, be. So you need to kind of like fulfill the user specification. Okay. But one thing that's the, 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 the difficult thing comes the following. Usually the user specification are sparse, right? Because a supposed user has time to check every single service point to its destination, then uh, the, the problem will be super simple. But usually that for a good algorithm to be useful, uh, it only requires user to input something that's super sparse, like just a couple clicks or jackings. And then it's up to us to decide what will be appropriate output shapes. So um, as you can see, maybe uh, all of the following would be appropriate output shapes, but uh, according to just fulfilling the sparse user input, but obviously we can tell that some of them might be a better candidate than the other. So to, uh, in order to navigate among these possibilities, um, the algorithm needs to kind of encode some sort of prior, like the, which shades might be a better answer than the other, and then, in order, and then choose that shapes uh, as the output. So I think this is precisely where, where the, most of the algorithm is working on. So for example, uh, a lot of traditional algorithm kind of use uh, this heuristic based prior. So for example, the smoothness of the surface, um, and uh, and that's basically uh, uh, helping to choose what uh, suppose the user's bed is missing or the user input is noisy. How do we decide what kind of survey is the reasonable output? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, survey should be rejected? And this same sort of prior needs to be in place when we change the representation. So most of the existing prior are discussed under the mesh as representation. Now that we each shape is a neural network, we kind of need to be able to do the same set of prior under this framework. Um, so that's what I view as one of the most challenging things uh, in order to do geometric processing tasks. And how does that challenge translate when we swap this representation? Okay, um, so um, there are many sort of prior. So um, in this works, I would mo mostly concerning about the uh, what I call physics inspired prior. Um, so the idea is like a good candidate, output candidate usually is the one that fulfills physical uh, rules. Um, so for example, like man made object usually have smooth surface. Um, elastic object usually uh, it deforms uh, with resistance to bending and stretching. This sort of prior uh, has been leveraged in the uh, in a uh, prior works on uh, mesh, and many of them are still uh, like widely used in uh, real world applications. Um, now the question is, all of this is uh, we need to quantify this priors into the algorithm, right? So we need to kind of have a number to measure uh, to instantiate this kind of prior in our algorithm. How do uh, so? How do we quantify them? Suppose we have the parameterization of the surface, like it maps from a 2D manifold to the, this, the, like we know the parameterization of the 2D manifold, then we can compute this, uh, these properties, like surface normal, or we can compute the area, we know the curvature, and all of that can be used then to compute the priors. And a lot of prior work are inspired by this notion of from geometry, uh, differential geometry. But, but, uh, but this, this kind of uh, parameterization does not exist for a lot of complicated shapes. So what if we do not have that? Um, so in the uh, pri uh, previously, suppose we have a mesh. Uh, there is a uh, another ways to derive the, this kind of property uh, from a discrete differential geometry. So we can still have an approximation of it, even though that it kind of depends on the discretization quality. So if the discretization does, uh, is like really bad managed. Maybe the estimation might not be as correct, but there is still a way to it once we get a good discretization. And in our case, um, the problem is, uh, is kind of different because um, the, the surface of interest is actually on the kernel of the function. It's not in the output of the function. Um, so we kind of want to be able to find a way to compute all of this property under this frameworks. Um, for example, how to compute surface normal of a level set. Um, so all of these operations in general will require de uh, derivatives. 
So very fortunately that we are in the uh, like in the worlds of like very easy to take derivatives. Uh, we have this auto uh, uh, graph frameworks, and we have the architecture that's built with a smooth activation and positional encodings. This kind of allows us to take derivative with the really high orders, and those derivatives does not really vanish. Um, so. The idea is, okay, now that we are able to uh, take derivatives, so we should be able to use those derivatives to compute this kind of prior, like to quantify. We can compute a service normal, and then we can compute a curvature, and then we can use those things to compute the prior. Um, and then the prior will act as the loss functions. So, uh, and then the geometric processing task can be formulated as the a optimization task. So, for example, uh, there are two types of laws that, that are listed here. One is the prior loss. It means that okay, the uh, if the prior loss is low, then the shape will look physically uh, uh, realistic. And then uh, if it's high, it means that the shape is, doesn't really obey physics law. And then the other set of laws is the uh, user spec laws. It means that if it's low, it mean uh, it will fulfill the user input. If it's not uh, high, it will just uh, it means the output shape is kind of violating the input. Uh, and then we optimize these two losses, uh, and then output uh, for some neural network parameters uh, for another neural fields, and that neural fields will predict the output shapes. So this is like the uh, general ideas of how we can do uh, geometric processing entirely with the uh, neural uh, with uh, neural fields. In this case, we don't need matching in any points of the any part of the algorithm. And each of the geometric tasks can be uh, formulated under this deep learning uh, optimization pro uh, problem. Um, so that's basically the general idea. Um, the rest of my talk, uh, I mean, the second part, I will just uh, uh, go into the deformation problem in details to see how we set up this kind of frameworks to uh, do as rigid as possible deformation. So uh, any questions so far? Um, I can. Maybe if you're saying you will just go into the deformation part, uh, what are the other parts? Um, so I also, uh, the other uh, part is smoothing. Um, so smoothing is basically you want to keep the core structure of the shape roughly to, to be the same, but the surface to, to be uh, more, uh, more smooth or more, uh, like with less uh, high frequency detail or with all more fre uh, high frequency detail. So that's uh, a smoothing or a sharpening or uh, what I also call filtering. And that's also doable by um, constructing the uh, a sort of prior loss and spec loss. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Then let's, cool. well, let's get to deformations. Sure. So. Uh, what is deformation in this case? Uh, so the, in our case, the input shape is going to be represented in a neural network neural fields. In this case, we specifically want a neural field that approximates the sign distance field of the input shapes. And then the user specification comes in as the following. So user will specify a set of handles. The handles will be points on the surface or points on the space. And each of the handles, they will set the target, which means that how they want these handle points to land. So for example, the first handle H1, the user wants it to check it to the target point T1, and the other two handles, the user wants it to be roughly stay the same. Uh, our algorithm wants to, uh, needs to predict a, a, a neural network whose ISO survey will look like a desirable output. And the key is, what is a desirable output? So the desirable output will, uh, will fulfill two criteria. One, it should fulfill the user specs, and second, it looks like a natural deformation. Um, so in this, in our task, we will consider elastic deformations uh, as, uh, to follow the uh, as rigid as possible deformation frameworks. So uh, what's uh, elastic deformation is a uh, you can think of it as you can imagine the deformation come from an elastic material that tend to return to the original form. So imagine a a something like uh, if you bend something with elastic property that there is a resistance to bending. So they want to go back to the original form. So it's like when you're stretching it, it has the resistance to go back to the original form. So this is uh, the elastic deformations that we want to model. So the prior loss in here will be if the output shapes come from a deformation that ensembles some sort of elastic deformation, 
then it will be a good uh, uh, desirable output shapes and then as long as that so that class of output shape fulfills the user specs that would be a good good choice so this is basically the framework that we will work on so uh, in order to do that we need to um kind of have a way to quantify how 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 good is the, this uh, output shapes fulfill uh, elastic deformations um so the uh, the idea is we want to measure the amount of stretching and bending it requires because uh, because if we require like drastically amounts of stretching and bending, it's probably not realistic deformation. Um, so in order to do that, my our general strategy is the following. So for each of the input shapes, I break it down to infinitely decimal small uh, like points like each of them are small patches, and then for each of the patches, I find a uh, uh, so, so the first, uh, first thing I do is I need to break down the input shape into small patches that amounts to sample points on the ISO surface. The second step is I need to find the corresponding patches on the deformed shapes. So, so I will be able to say that, okay, th uh, this patch from input space match to the other patch from the output space. And then finally, once we know uh, this two patch, we will be able to compare them and compute that how much stretching and bending does it require to get from this patch uh, to, uh, to another one. And, uh, and then we just kind of aggregate all of them by the integration. So this is like the general strategy, uh, strategy of how do, uh, how do I compute stretching and bending in, in the paper. Okay, so the first step is sampling. So we want to sample from a neural field. The way that we do it is we want to leverage this nice property of the sign distance field. So the idea is that for any points in the space, if you take the inverse the surface normal direction uh, with the lens proportional to the distance, you will land on the ISO surface. More or moreover, it will land on the closest point to you uh, from the ISO surface. So that's like a nice property of sign distance field. Why? So why sorry? Is the, why is the normal? <clears throat> Why is the normal of our surface normalized, so to say? Like if we uh, just take the gradient um, mm -hmm. uh, to our surface, why is it length one? Is that just something that we uh, want, that we put as uh, additional loss during learning the sine distance function? So uh, I think that, uh, that's a mathematical property of sine distance functions. So that you can think, yeah, yeah. yeah. But if we now represent it as a neural field, the sine distance function, why? Right. Yeah. So, so it's not guaranteed that uh, each of uh, the, the gradient of the neural field will be the, exactly the normal ones. So usually people need to train it while they're supervising it. So my way to, uh, uh, but usually if the neural field is well trained, uh, this property will preserve in most of the space. Uh, my way to treat it is I just take the gradient of the neural field and normalize it. Uh, and usually they wouldn't be too far away um, unless it's closer to one of the, uh, the problematic points of non-smoothness of the field, for example, like the medial axis. And in those points, um, the, it will be really problematic. Uh, but those points usually aren't too uh, affecting most of the uh, ISO surface. So yeah. OK. But it's a good question. So it's not guaranteed that my neural network's gradient will, be, uh, will have norm ones. And it's also not guaranteed that this property will be satisfied by the network. But the, if the network is a good approximation, um, we can still leverage that in the sense that it wouldn't be too far away. But but my way to handle it is like, I take the normal, I do normalization, I do multiple steps. Like for example, like I do this projection and then I just redo it again. So just in case that the, mm -hmm. the shooting of the surface normal does not really land on the right spot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so What's the naive way to sample points in the, uh, using this property? We can sample uniformly on the ambient space. And then we, we use this property to send them to the uh, ISO surface to send it to its closest point. But this is not uh, is problematic because uh, if it's a high curvature area, it will affect a larger region in the ambient space. So uh, more points will send to the high curvature area than a flat area. So as a result, you can see that if we just do it naively like this, we can uh, most of the point are concentrating in the in the places where there's like really uh, 
like a bumps, um, and that's not good because we want a uh, uniform samples on the surface. Um, there's one very simple trick that we can fix it. The idea is how about we just filter points that are too far away and create a little bit of like this envelopes around the ISO surface through rejection sampling. So we sample a bunch of points on the surface. We throw away those whose uh, uh, norm, uh, whose distance are way too big. And then we will create this kind of envelopes uh, around the surface and then on the for every point within the envelope, we send it to the surface. In that case, we can uh, roughly already uh, distribute the points uh, uniformly across the surface in a coarse way. Um, and then we can do multiple iteration of this just to shuffle it up. Um, so this actually works pretty well in my case uh, on, on most of the shapes that I need. And uh, that's why I stick with that. Multi uh, so this gives me really good uniform sample. Okay, so what you do is, um, like our problem is that, for example, if we just, if we just sample points here, all around here, mm -hmm. then all of those points would basically end up, um, this would be the closest point of the, of the dinosaur, right? And mm, this right. is the problem that we end up um, only sampling points that are like in high curvature areas, is that the problem? That yeah, the problem is, that, yeah, the other way to look at that is if we look at a high curvature area and all the points whose nearest point is this high curvature area uh, going out into the ambient space, that's really a large region, right? So imagine yeah. a really pointy point and then, all, and then the other two parts flat, then all the points that goes like this faint will go, we'll have closest point of this pointy end. Yeah. And all of that point will send to this pointy vertex. Yeah. So that's why uh, if we sample the ambient space with a high likelihood, the closest point on the surface will be coming from a high curvature point. So that's and why uh, the inverse of what you're draw drawing. Yeah. So, so now what you're doing instead is to only sample points in like this region right here, and then, yeah, we will, or well, you sample points everywhere, but you throw them away if they're not in this region, and then right. you end up with something nice like this. Right, and okay. one interesting thing is like this region can be pretty thick. Um, it doesn't have to be a really so narrow region. Like... Because in that case, the rejection rate will be really high. Okay. Yeah, something like this. Good, good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Any other question before I proceed? Um, cool. So now we get the sampling down. The second step is um, the correspondence. Like, uh, how do we uh, match the uh, patch from input shapes to the output shapes? Um, so it's very. Uh, my way to do it is very simple. Um, I just define the output uh, fields to be like the uh, the input field value of a spatial point warped by a deformation. Um, the key is it would be ideal uh, that this deformation is invertible. Otherwise, there will be like multiple ma uh, points in the space mapped into one point, or the other way, uh, one point mapped into like multiple a uh, really large region. Um, the ways that we achieve this invertibility is to take the invertible residual network architecture to model the deformation. Um, but naively applying that does not give us really good results. Uh, the the res uh, invertible ResNet uh, usually will tend to predict something that's like scaling uh, a lot of uh, without the rotation. Um, because it's kind of piecewise linear in the middle. And so predict a rotation in with a piecewise linear network uh, deformation is actually pretty difficult. Um, so what I do uh, is that is I want to inject the positional encoding into the uh, in, uh, invertible ResNet. So you can think of positional encoding actually encode some of the sinusoidal wa uh, waves. And all of that can be uh, uh, leveraged together to compute something that's uh, to make the uh, rotation more easy. So the positional uh, adding positional encoding allows us to bump up the enough of the expressiveness of the invertible ResNet to be able to predict the kind of deformation that we want. Okay. 
Um, the tricky thing is like the positional encoding uh, when uh, naively put into the invertible ResNet will make it non-invertible. So because the, the requirement for the invertible ResNet to be invertible is the G theta here to be Lipschitz, uh, to have Lipschitz const, uh, constant less or equals to one. Um, so I have to kind of modify the positional encoding to have a really small ways on the high frequency region in order to keep it uh, under the Lipschitz constant. Um, so that's a little uh, implementation detail there. Um, but with the position encoding and invertible rest net, I'm able to establish this correspondence, and the network is actually expressive enough to predict a wide variety of deformation that I need. Can you like um, spend a few more minutes on explaining why the position encoding is, is necessary? Mm -hmm. So um, the original invertible rest net, uh, they are basically piecewise linear uh, networks in yeah. inference. And so they basically divide in the space into a bunch of like piecewise lead. But oh, okay, let me take a step back. This is my hypothesis. So empirical result is uh, I need positional encoding to get to the rotations. What I'm talking about is my hypothesis of why. Okay, this is my, okay. So for invertible ResNet, they are piecewise linear. So they basically divide the space into different regions. Uh, and each of the region are a little bit uh, uh, are bounded by a bunch of hyperplanes in the 3D, and within that region, it can be uh, the rotation can be determined by a simple equation, a x plus b, because that's the definition of piecewise linear. Um, so, uh, so in order to, uh, in that doesn't give a really expressive uh, uh, things because like imagine that you want something that's a rotation then uh, like a larger rotation then you need to coordinate a lot of the region in order to do this consistent rotation um so it wasn't quite as uh, nicely done um yeah. i yeah there are other ways around it potentially so for example you can use some um some non piecewise linear activation for example like the uh, elu functions or some smooth activation um, I put, I empirically didn't observe a lot of improvements with uh, switching to smooth uh, activations, um, and my inspiration to add a position encoding is suppose I want to do a rotation. So suppose I want to model a global rotation. Mm -hmm. What kind of function do we need to input in terms of coordinate in order for the networks to be during the rotation already. Um, so I was thinking that sine cosine is like very important part of the rotation matrix. So we should probably uh, have the network uh, to get access to those um, and then put it up in the a systematic way. Uh, it's like this so, position. Wait, so am I understanding correctly that this part of the argument is just that well, if we have rotation matrices in, um, in 3D, then we always, and we have some angle, and then we always need the sine and cosine of those angles to um, go from our parameterization to the actual rotation matrix. And you want to say that that's a good reason why we use positional encoding. Uh, I want to say that's a good reason. It's more or less my way toward it. <laughs> but but okay. usually, like encoding it, uh, can provide a, a chance for uh, for us to encode like high frequency information yeah so yeah, yeah. and that uh, but but it's kind of uh, but that kind of applies to the normal positional encoding in this case the high frequency information is also dimmed down because otherwise it wouldn't be invertible so um, it kind of like we allow high frequency information but we ask the network to be able to model it in a really conservative way, unless you really want to enlarge your ways to two to the ten. Otherwise, you won't be able to leverage as much of the high frequency information. So that's why I didn't really go for the high frequency uh, uh, high frequency explanation because I think um, yeah. it's a lot of mixed between. Yeah. All right, Don. What's your comment? Can you explain a bit uh, more, like what? Uh, where and how and what kind of positional encoding you use? Is this in the next slides or? Um, oh, no, just I, it's orange, in my hidden right? slide. It's in oh. my hidden slide. Okay. okay. So basically the uh, here is a invertible rest net block. So what I do is um, this is a bunch of networks mm -hmm. and then this is the coordinates. 
the idea is like I will, uh, this bunch of network is G theta. Um, sorry, this uh, this is the small G theta here. Okay, it's not a big uh, capitalized G theta, and that should determine uh, and that should predict like how this uh, coordinate should be moved uh, to the next steps. And uh, the positional encoding is input into the very first place in of the small g theta here. Yeah, well, can I maybe interrupt you? Maybe yeah. it's, uh, some people might think that the positional encoding here is something similar to what we do or fulfills a similar purpose as uh, the purpose it fulfills in transformers. But this is not the case, right? I think they are super related. So for transformers, yeah. um, you were uh, so let me explain this position encoding. I, I personally think of it as you break down uh, the position and have so imagine this is a binary position encoding. Everything above is once and it, uh, below is negative one. You basically give a hash to the each of the coordinate in the space, and based on this hash, like which position of them is similar, you will be able to place two points in. Uh, into a similar matrix based on the, some checkerboards, right? So I think that's also something that the transformer uh, is leveraging because originally, if you just have a range of words, you don't know where that is, but you kind of want to know that whether it's two apart, or sorry, oh. it's like two periodic apart or four periodic apart, right? So you hash it into like, if it's two periodic, it's one, it's, it's within the four periodic, it's uh, zero, for example, and then you can compare two items and see that yes. if both, uh, yeah, if both of them is one, it's probably similar in the sense that it's hash in this checkerboard, and and then you look at the second thing. If they are far apart, then it means that oh, it's probably in th the other frequency they are not. So this yeah. is basically the same thing. But in the uh, so the function in the end is the same thing, but. Uh, I still think in, in transformers or like if we have sequence in some yeah transformer, then it fulfills another purpose because there we have no no notion of location at all in our network in the beginning, and we use it to like we add it to have some sense of where we are in the sequence. But here we actually absolutely know um, the like all information is available to where the different positions are, but we make it much easier for the network to pick up, right? Because we um, turn these small, small differences in uh, the small difference in differences in coordinate space, we encode them with high frequency um, signs and cosines. Is so, right yeah. Then? Um, so I think the diff, uh, I think it's right that it enhanced the uh, ability for the networks to uh, to distinguish between two coordinate and make different decision between them. But I think it's also the case in transformer because what's the alternative ways to do it with yes, uh, but here here we we could also distinguish it if we had no right. positional encoding. In theory, we could do it. But we make right. it easier for the network. In the transformer, we couldn't distinguish it. Okay. Where we have no. Oh, here, right. right, right. I understand. So the so but but, but I think uh, we are comparing two different things. So with uh, X Y Z coordinates only versus X Y Z coordinate with the transform uh, with the position encoding in our case should be equivalent to transformer, but have oh, zero one two three as index versus transformer with uh, okay okay okay. Yeah. okay yeah true that's true but yeah then so it, then the function like but mm -hmm. then also the function that you're using here is different because yeah in the transformer we would just add the positional encoding and here we really put the points into the positional encoding but yeah i think yeah, you're yeah. getting a bit too detailed into this um yeah maybe quick just quickly um, let's also look at, at, at this function here, your gamma, where we throw the points, like what are we actually doing when we're talking about position encoding? 
Yeah, so basically we we have this little uh, the hash of different uh, uh, frequencies, but the key thing is I need to also divide it by the frequency in order to kind of keep it uh, uh, to be bounded with a certain Lipschitz constant. Uh, otherwise, the, inver uh, the network wouldn't be invertible. So that's basically saying that if you want to leverage some high frequency uh, information, uh, uh, like if you want to leverage this part of encoding, that will only contribute really smallly to your output unless you have a ways that's super big applying here. Um, Wait, so that's why, like, why wouldn't it be invertible? If... Oh, so for invertible residual network, so is a is a sufficient condition for this network's x to x prime to be invertible if all the things in between this this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. but I mean, why do we need the why do we need the division to make it invertible? Ah, uh, otherwise the, the Lipschitz constant uh, is really big. Okay, so it would in theory be invertible, but it's uh, very computationally um, poor. Oh no, I think. Um, you can still find some instance that's invertible. So, so what do we want to be invertible here? So we are mapping from x to x prime, which is the input space coordinate to the output space coordinate. We want this mapping to be invertible. Yeah. And one sufficient condition of that is the Lipschitz constant of this networks in the middle it should be bounded okay. with a lesser one. So it's not that I want the positional encoding to be invertible. It's like I want the positional encoding to have the property that is uh, the Lipschitz constant is not too big. Yeah, but I and mean that's why what I said. Yeah. Okay, but the like the Lipschitz constant would always be stay bounded even if we don't divide, right? It would. Um, it would just get very large, uh, but it would still right. Be the less or equal to one. I think that's the uh, that's the sufficient condition that I'm working on. It's oh, the same okay. sufficient. Yeah. Yes, right. We need uh, less or equal to one and not just uh, bounded. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot more sense. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I would also like to to add that. Uh... When, when you're looking here at uh, deforming 3D meshes um, in a smooth way, the high frequency mm. information is also going to, to look at, uh, to, to have the network focus on uh, small deformations and high frequency deformations, which is not necessarily what we want. Uh, so by having this equation being, um, like by, by having the denominator uh, focus on the low frequency instead of the high frequency, it allows really the network to bend more smoothly the objects. Uh, uh, for, for example, um, if we have that the, if L for example is the length of the object, then the cosine and sine would divide the object into uh, the positive part being the first half and the negative part being the second half. And it would allow like uh, the, this uh, smooth bending between the two whether with the higher frequency like uh, like the, the higher the frequency you go the more you you're bending uh, some local regions of of the mesh so in some sense i think it also makes sense with the, what you're trying to do here to use to to weight the low frequency more like i'm not a hundred percent convinced by this but we also can't spend the whole presentation explaining stuff to me so um, yeah. Oh, we can come back to that later if it keeps interest. But but yeah, I think that's a very good uh, uh, explanation. I do okay. observe in empirical data that um, like this uh, this network architecture is actually helping to preserve the most uh, the deformation. So it's not just the laws that do all the part. Like the way that I structure the network actually also helps me a little bit. Um. So, okay. So maybe I should go through the uh, the next part. Um. So. Now that we have the the matchings uh, like, uh, between those two patches, um, so uh, so now we can just start to compare and see that okay, given the patch on the left, how much bending and stretching does it take to become the uh, patch on the right? Okay, so that's what the the third step is doing, and then 
let's uh, talk, uh, so the first thing is let's talk about how to measure stretching. So um, the stretching can be intuitively understand as the uh, change of like the tangent dot product. Um, why is that the case? So imagine that you want to stretch this uh, blue patch on the red arrow direction. Intuitively, it would become slightly longer in that direction. It means that the, the, you can think of it as like under the same parameterization, the tangent uh, vector along that direction will be slightly longer. Um, but uh, the other the tangent vector might slightly be, uh, get uh, rotated or skewed by uh, this uh, stretch as well. So you can, uh, what would be a good way to capture like this change of the length and change of like the angles of the tangent vector? So we want to, uh, one way to do it is like this dot product on the tangent space can but be one measure. Isn't that very similar to curvature in the end somehow? Uh, not exactly. So curvature is more like the uh, it's more related to bending. So you can think of it. Um, so there are way to stretch the shape without changing the curvature. Imagine you have a box, you stretch in both way. None of the curvature are changing. Yeah. But only yeah. the curvature are changing. Yeah. But yeah. but curvature is related, is uh, related to the bending, and we are measuring both. So curvature is definitely in the equation. Yeah. Okay. So. I guess, uh, yeah, I, I kind of skipped the map here. We can discuss more in detail. So the idea is um, we don't have a really good ways to measure the tangent uh, dot product because we don't have the parameterization. But our way to resolve it is to relate it back to the, amb uh, the dot product of the ambient space and then use the projection matrix to uh, relate the dot product of ambient space to the dot product of the two tangent vectors. And use that, uh, and then we integrate uh, all over the place such that uh, we were able to say that if there is any tangent dot product change in any direction, we will be able to notice that in the uh, in this loss function. So that's like a rough idea. Um, okay. So uh, as for bending, bending can be categorized as the change of service uh, the curvature. So imagine that you want to bend the blue patch to uh, to the uh, orange one. You basically you need to bend outward, right? So you basically change it from a more curved surface to a less curved surface. So um, the key to measure uh, the, bend, the amount of bending that requires is you need to find a ways to measure the curvature. So what curvature? Uh, so there are many notions of measuring curvature. So my way to kind of uh, intuitively explain it is like you can think of it as like the change along the surface normal direction. So imagine that it's a really flat surface, and then you uh, you ask each of the surface points to evolve in a constant speed along the its surface normal direction. It doesn't change much, right? Because everything, uh, each point is evolving the, in a constant speed, and and they each point are, uh, they are flat on the flat surface. But if it's in a high curvature uh, places, each of the points are evolving in a different directions, right? And uh, in as a result, it will create a much more um, uh, change in the uh, surface. So and uh, this can be captured by the Hessian matrix of the few uh, functions. Um, so basically, the notion of Gaussian curvature or the mean curvature, they can all be linked to the uh, Hessian of the field function. Um, so uh, because the, you can intuitively understand in the Hessian uh, categorizing the change in three the in three directions that's aligned with x, y, z. But alternatively, you can rotate this such that two of the direction is the tangent normal direction and one of them is the surface normal direction. And since the surface normal always grow at constant rate in the sun distance field, so the Hessian major will actually also capture the other direction that happens in the surface um, that's perpendicular to the surface normal direction. So basically you can distill all the, the curvature information almost um, from the Hessian major of the field function. Um, so this is basically what we do here. Um, we uh, use projection uh, and the and the hashing to compute uh, the curvature, and then I uh, then the change of the curvature is measured uh, to is computed to measure the bending. So bending uh, the amount of bending is uh, captured in this loss. The amount of stretching is captured in the other loss. We put both of them together. Adding another terms uh, that enforce the user specification to be uh, in, uh, to be satisfied, 
will and minimizing this loss will get, get us the uh will get us the shapes that can both look realistically uh uh deformed like elastic materials uh also fulfilling the um, the user specs so that's how i kind of set up the frameworks for deformation let's look at some of the results of this uh three uh some of the typical shapes on as rigid as deformation um, so basically the user specify this region to be fixed, this region to be moved here. As you can see, it also rotate for 90 degrees. Um, and then you'll be able to uh, bend the shapes. And this is the ISO surface of the output networks. So uh, along the ways, we never do uh, triangulation. Um, so the triangulation is uh, it's only done after the deformation is done uh, for visualization purpose. And this is a visualization of the optimization uh, process um, yeah of a Pokemon so they first uh, uh, satisfy the user input and then gradually fix the parts uh, here such that it doesn't uh, result create as much bending and stretching uh, at the same time fulfilling the user aspect right where do you take your like are these in the geometry processing literature, is the dinosaur, for example, a standard thing that people use, like the bundle? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so this these three shapes, uh, I basically follow the uh, as rigid as possible papers. So those are the shapes that almost uh, all follow words needs to demonstrate. Uh, Pokemon is for fun. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, yeah. I like the dinosaur the best. <laughs> but the oh, yeah. one's also cool. Right, right. Okay, so that concludes the second part of my talk. Uh, so I guess if we have time, we can talk about some of the limitation going forwards. Um, yeah. Um. Well. Yeah. No. Before we were at the slide now. Uh, maybe, what would be a baseline, or what would we say is uh something that solves this job much poorer than, than you do now? So I think uh, one thing that, uh, so our goal is like, suppose we give me a uh, a neural field and then we want to deform it, right? So suppose uh, you, I have no restriction, like you're allowed to do meshing. So uh, one of the strong, uh, very strong baseline is you take the neural field, you do the marching queue, and then you run the traditional mesh processing algorithm on it and then you train the and the, suppose the output we still want the neural field out so i guess in that case we can rerun the data generation pipeline to optimize another neural field um so this pipeline will actually create two problems so uh, the first problem is using marching queues to get the surface right uh so to to discretize the surface it's not a really good idea, especially when you want to do some uh, downstream applications. Mm -hmm. So in my paper, I show that uh, if you do that naively, um, not only does it uh, like makes the deformation really sl slow. So originally people are able to do it in real time in low poly, but if you need to uh, do poor margin kill with a really uh, fine surface detail, that, that you takes a uh, much longer time. And then the second thing is like the performance is actually pretty bad because um, when you compute the, the little uh, the curvature, like the scale of the curvature will be kind of depends on the how well you actually not scale like the quality of the, the curvature is kind of depends on how well you um, uh, you discretize it. So ideally, um, you probably need to run some resurface uh, remeshing algorithms such that you move move the triangulations yeah. in such that is uh, good for the downstream processing task, but that actually requires some manual tuning. So you kind of need to play with a hyperparameter such that it doesn't lose the surface uh, details, but at the same time, it kind of uh, um, plays it in the right way. So that's like downstream ones, you kind of need to get that right in order for the, um, the, for the second pass to work. And the second thing is, uh, suppose you want the neural feedback. Uh, in that case, you need to run another algorithm to yeah, change the neural field. That that might be long, yeah. Okay, but then how? Um, if I'm now a user of this, I have your, um, say, I always rend, I always have my neural neural field, and I render it every few seconds with a 
uh, with some mm. marching cube and then some mesh and then some light rays bouncing off that mesh or something like that. And yeah, if I do that every few seconds, how would that be computationally good or? So computation in this uh, so so far the, the what that's like one of the like main concerns uh, limitation of the method is like um, so I wouldn't worry too much about the computation for um, rendering and uh, seeing what the neural field looks like. There are okay, many ways. So I'm imagining uh, the, the user sitting there and having um, and doing this dragging here, for example. And then right, right. if we're doing that. Um, then this can happen in real time and the, the rendering is no problem. But now the, the deformation maybe can become a problem. Yeah, so deformations, the time is actually the big problem. So I think that that's actually the very first limitation that I want to talk about. I think that's what the reviewer concerned the most. Uh, which is like it takes a really long time to train. So it takes five to 10 hours. Uh, once I tune hyperparameter, it can get one or two hours, but that's still hours. Um, so no one wants to wait for hours to see the editing results. Um, but I think uh, that's basically due to the fact that I want to put up this pipeline as a proof of concept, but I didn't optimize the pipeline. So there is actually many ways to optimize the pipelines uh, right now. Uh, for example, we can do divide and conquer, right? We don't. Uh, so the one of the reason that it takes really long time to optimize is it battles between fulfilling the uh, user pers uh, uh, user specs, and at the same time they want to fix all the uh, small things on the surface. Um, but but when it when the user specs are really small, then it only affects like, a small region of the surface. In that case, the optimization actually happens to be super fast. So uh, one way that we can potentially speed it up is like, how about we just break it down to multiple optimization, smaller optimization tasks. I actually do a preliminary experiments on this. Um, one huge one, it takes an hour or so um, after I optimize the training and the code. But uh, if I take it into five small ones, each of them takes like just uh, in terms of minutes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, that's like there are so you can see that's like one very um, uh, naive ways that we can optimize the, the speeds already. Um, there are many more, for example, we don't need to start from scratch, for example. Um, sure. Once you give me a deformation form, we don't, uh, we kind of know there is some sort of deformation that can already fulfill most of the uh, needs. And then uh, we can just uh, fine tune it for like the specific surface. So we can take the, this is like another idea that uh, has been leveraged in the meta SDF. Uh, so they want, when they want to uh, start uh, generating the neural field, they will don't uh, they don't need, want to start from scratch every time. So they want to learn the initialization such that the initialization is already good at generating that. So I think the one potential ways to accelerate us uh, this deformation uh, optimization is we don't need to, uh, to learn this kind of initialization or we can, we can even predict this kind of initialization based on the user specs, uh, such that we don't need to um, go from guessing all around uh, and can uh, basically jump to the points of the fine details. Um, alternatively, we can, uh, we can narrow the deformation space. For example, right now our framework basically allows you to check every arbitrary point, right? Um, but most of the use case, we probably don't need to care about arbitrary service points deformed. Uh, most of the interest, uh, we only care about certain interest uh, team points uh, to be deformed. So for example, SNOF is basically doing a skeleton based deformations and neural cage can break it down to multiple uh, fixed number of cage handles. And those can be helps to um, speed up the deformation because in that case the deformation networks, um, most of the, the the thing that needs to be learned will be smaller. Um, yeah, I just to spend uh, put out a few ideas here. So yeah, I think those are the few ideas I have uh, uh, yeah. on potential speeding up it. Okay, and the the I find the the meta SDF thing very exciting. But now you already teasered the next slide and with your figure one, and that I'm really curious about. Oh, okay. Talk about that. So, 
Yeah, the, the other limitation uh, uh, we have is we kind of will rely on the quality of the neural field. So for example, if the neural, uh, we kind of assume the neural field uh, emits some uh, understandable meaningful curvature as if it's normal, uh, but that's not always the case. So for example, if I didn't do a really good job training sirens on the SDF of a square, the surface of the square can be rippling. And then imagine taking the curvature of that and use that for loss. It doesn't really uh, help mm -hmm. with the optimization. So it's like, for example, we want to take the surface from nerve on uh, at certain threshold naively and use that to do deformation. That wouldn't really uh, work naively if the surface look quality looks like this. So ideally, uh, this this is something that I also are uh, interested in looking at. So is there a ways to uh, like? Uh, robustly take gradient from neural fields even though the neural field can have some um, uh, problems because otherwise we kind of rely on the neural field to be really clean and that doesn't uh, apply to a, uh, a lot of the uh, application. The, in, I mean in that case don't we just fall back into the same artifact of mesh that uh, we want the mesh discretization to be well done before I can apply the uh, processing task. So yeah, that's another limitation that I uh, that I'm concerning about, and I'm still thinking of ways to uh, work on it. Okay, so you're really this is really the space um, you're further pursuing. Like you set up this basic example, basically showing everyone that it can be done, and now you're you're making it very good. Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, this is something that I'm thinking about pursuing. Like, I don't have a concrete solution yet. I think it's yeah, uh, but I mean, yeah. um, it is further your direction that you'll continue working on in the future and are working on right now. It's not like, yeah, now we're done with neural geometry fields or yeah, and right. now you're working on yeah. something else. No. Yeah, definitely. This and that um, definitely is still interesting. I think it's a wide open uh, problem and uh, there are many o open questions uh, that we can uh, find here. Like for example, is there ways to change uh, this kind of neural representation that allows uh, stable gradient um, outputs uh, for mm -hmm. different needs? Um, because imagine that most of the way, like imagine we want to train it from image supervision. Maybe image supervision isn't uh, considered enough the downstream application that one, for example, in my case, geometric processing. So, what what uh, so what would be the difference? Like, uh, and is there a way to fill in the gaps? So I think, yeah, as you say, it's something that I'm I'm pursuing. Uh, I'm interested in pursuing right now, but I don't have a solution for. But I think it's a really important question to answer. Okay, well, it's kind of uh, great, I would say, that you basically found this. Uh, area now or founded it maybe somewhat um, like the geometry processing with neural fields and yeah now you're um, making it better further. all right um, any other points you wanted to to cover or questions from someone else i think i think it's just one last slide so it's yeah. about Creation of few properties. So this is like the, the, the one of the last limitation slide that I have. So uh, this is basically the idea that we ask for so much as an input, but we give uh, too much, uh, too little as output. So we ask the fields to be approximately sine distance field as inputs, but after we deform it, we actually did not preserve the it to be a sine distance field. This is actually preventing us from do the deformation again. So this is a, another thing that I view it as pretty uh, something that I can improve uh, on the frameworks. So oh. for example, yeah. Why is it no longer uh, a sine distance field? Uh huh. So imagine the ideal deformation of it is to smash it into a really small ones, and then from our, my the, my the, uh, from my formulation, G theta is basically we go back to the original sine distance field and query that number. Yeah. But that deformation actually change the field so much such that the distance will get squeezed, right? So it's no longer the value sign distance field. Okay, so it could, it, it just doesn't work, but um, there's no no theoretical principle why it's, um, why it can't be possible, uh, why the network couldn't learn to uh, preserve the, the SDF. 
Uh, I think the I think the network could learn to preserve the SDF uh, with some modification. So that's why I I kind of like um the uh, proposed several uh, potential fix here. I don't think there is some fundamental difficulty um blocking them from doing it. Um, because okay. I think uh, yeah 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 it's more like my uh, my formulation. <laughs> it's uh, just that an empirical observation in the end that uh, it doesn't happen. Right. It's more like the artifact of my 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 implementation of this algorithm. <laughs> like, okay. uh, there are different ways to do it. For example, the output field doesn't have to define exactly the ways that I do it. Um, yeah. And yeah, so there are many ways to fix that. But this is the one thing that could prevent taking my algorithm and say that okay, let's ship it to the um the, the downstream application for artists to use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's the last slide I have. And no, <laughs> we, we have no hurries here, so okay. I can go as long as uh, as you have time. Okay, no, sure. Any, um, any questions? Right, I think it's a good time to take questions. Is there a question in the chat? That was able to yeah, see. No, but then maybe what do you think is the or yeah, let's go with that first. What do you think is the most um, promising sort of application with this? Like where this could really be end up as a useful application in the end? And like, is it the, the, the case where we have some graphics designers dragging around dinosaurs or? Yeah. I see. Uh, so, so the one that might be very interesting in is physical simulation. Um, so, most of the physical simulation that uh, so for example, if you want to do soft body robots and you want to uh, simulate something that's running in certain sort of dynamics, you kind of need access to um, the, the geometry, but at the same time, you also want access to property of the geometry. And uh, so most, uh, so I think this is, could be a potential ways that uh, we allow the physical simulation to uh, represent some uh, to work with geometry that's more complicated, um, and and a lot uh, because to, uh, previously if we want the geometry to be working with a dynamical system then and have a gradient on it we kind of need to know the analytical form so right now we learn some neural networks that allows the gradient so maybe in that case we will be able to plug this neural network into the simulation system. And the neural network allows to uh, have the gradients, so the simulation system is able to use those gradients to do PDEs. So that's something that I'm actually pretty excited to look in, um, uh, look into. So for example, the neural ODE can be uh, maybe like there's some form of uh, neural ODE that can model the uh, uh, the environment, and there is some form of the neural fields that can model the object, and then we can simulate uh, the physics interaction between them so, wait, um, so we, this is um we take a scan of some car or something oh yeah let's let's go with that example we take a scan of a car we um we turn the scan of the car with i don't know what people use lidar or whatever we turn it into a mesh and then we learn a neural neural field of that mesh and now have our neural field representation of the car then we um, put it into some wind simulations or something like that and calculate drag that is going on. And then we minimize the shape or we, we optimize the neural field such that drag is minimized and then we end up with a new car design. Yeah, so in that case, we don't even need to go to mesh. We can go straight to neural field from scans. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's one thing that, uh, that I'm excited about because in the, in that case we we have access to the gradients, which might be what the like uh, physical simulation uh, wants access to. But at the same time, also the geometry that and that our in our way the geometry can be represented in high details. Um, so that's something that I think well, we can be potentially bring advantage to. But yeah, this is one example that I had in mind. Uh, I actually have the discussion question to be like, what uh, to to ask for, like, what would be some other applications that might be advantageful. But I think in general, 
I think uh, the advantage that uh, neural field uh, potentially can bring into the application is the following. Once, if you want something that represents a field in a compact way, I think neural field would be a good candidate because you basically train it to be compact, uh, to compress information. And suppose uh, the second thing is that it allows access to uh, the derivative pretty easily. Um, it actually allows access to a, a higher order derivative pretty easily. So if you think about application that might require that and you don't want to do finite elements uh, derivative computation, uh, this could be a candidate. And then um, the third, uh, let's talk about the fourth thing is, uh, so because it kind of inherits the, uh, the advantage of implicit fields, right? So you will be, if your application require change of topology on the uh, geometry, maybe this is also the, uh, the neural field could be something that you consider. Imagine that you want to model when the, mm -hmm. uh, when the thing cracks open and break into two parts. Um, cracking open a mesh might be, pro uh, might be pretty hard to handle, uh, but just, cracking open the neural fields, I think that that could be uh, potentially learned uh, to be uh, done in a good way. And the final thing I think is the third one. Since everything is within this deep learning framework, so you can potentially uh, build it up to take more data price um, into the picture. So if you want to, uh, if you want your shape to be optimized for some data driven priors, uh, and you want to use deep learning, maybe the neural field is one way to represent the shapes that uh, that allows you to do that more easily. Okay, so you're saying you want to constrain a certain shape to change in a way to be uh, to be to stay similar to a neural field and and encode geometric priors via a neural field or I don't really didn't get the last one. Oh, so the last one is suppose your your shape representation. You want to kind of optimize a collection of shapes, or yeah. you want to optimize certain shapes with uh, with respect to some data driven prior. Or uh, in that case, like uh, I mean, it would be nice to, if you want to do that with the deep learning. I mean, the neural field is basically the, something that you can incorporate into the deep learning framework really naturally. So um, that might be one candidate you consider. Uh, for those alternative things that you need to kind of, um, you can do it with a mesh, but then you need to, yeah, I think that, I think this is, uh, you can still do it with a mesh, but you probably want to use um, different, uh, yeah, with a mesh specific encoder, that's also a candidate, but um, this is like one thing that uh, neural field allows uh, at the same time with all the other things, so. Yeah, okay, okay. But then if you're talking about, um, or no, let me ask a question first, or maybe my last one. Are you now working on some concrete applications, like the ones we, we talked about, like some science applications or simulations or something? Are you collaborating with any other group there? Um, so far, the, the kind of question that I'm working on is this one because I think this uh, yeah, okay. this will be a uh, uh, blocking uh, elements if we want to use it for some other applications. So uh, what I'm currently working on is to uh, derive a ways to either through um, uh, laws or through uh, architectural change to allow some uh, yeah, stable gradient methods in order to uh, do geometric processing. So I think this is kind of rooted through a lot of the uh, advantages I'm claiming. So that's something that I'm working on right now. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just think it would be really cool if one of these uh, like drag optimization um, problems, mm. for example, if this really becomes useful for some practitioners mm. and if they uh, actually yeah, it's it gives us it, it. We discover a new shape with it, so to say, or like an optimal shape for a specific problem. Um, okay, well then we have a question, Artos. Yes, hello. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for the talk. It was a very interesting paper. Uh, no, I just wanted to continue on this uh, theme of optimizing because I'm I'm looking kind of into it and. Uh -huh. Uh, so the, the image that was demonstrated with this drive optimization that's in a sense is exactly what's what's done there uh, mm. like shape optimization with the 
with these implicit fields, but the kind of problem is you can do shape optimization, but topology optimization is way, way harder uh, mm -hmm. because you kind of have these discrete events happening. So punching a hole. So it is smooth in the function representation, but it's not example smooth for the SDF, it's also for the assigned distance field. Because imagine you punch a hole in like a circle. So suddenly it, the middle of the circle was the furthest away from the boundary, but now it's it's basically zero. So you mm -hmm. require to change a lot in the in the assigned distance field. So it's not it's not so smooth. And it's it's even a challenge in like classical shape and topology optimization, so do topology optimization due to this reason. Yeah, well, so do you know if there are actually already people that um, use shape optimization like uh, using um, using neural fields in practice? Yes. In so the there's difference? certainly one paper which works on like a benchmark problem of uh, truss shape optimization. So these, um, it's like a 2D problem where you optimize like a beam yeah but i mean kind of this is not that this doesn't mean that actually people are using it really right in, in practice you mean yeah. so th this paper that this mesh df paper that is on the screen right now it's actually mm -hmm. from a company called uh, uh what's the company's name neural concept Many hell. sorry yeah. Many neural of the concept. Yeah. yeah yeah so the company is called Neural Concept, and they it is like a spin-off, and they try to use this in, in practice. So probably if you look toward real commercial application, that would be the closest place to look. Yeah, cool. So we're not just um, <laughs> toying around anymore. This stuff is mm -hmm. getting useful. All right. Um, I also wanted to comment on the data-driven prior because uh, kind of maybe struggle to find the practical examples. And, so, of course, one kind of, well, you could imagine instead of doing shape optimization from scratch, you maybe have a collection of shapes that already work. So collection of cars like we have in this image. Hmm. So then uh, you kind of use existing, you kind of navigate in the latent space that you first kind of learn. And if so, you can do it with meshes up to a certain degree, but then you're like assume that all these things have the same topology, right? But mm. as this car, uh, it's actually highlighted in one of the images in front of the bumper, it has these holes, but maybe some other cars do not have these holes. So you want to have this topological flexibility, but you're moving in the latent space. You're kind of optimizing in the latent space. So that circumnavigates this issue of punching discrete holes in the geometric space. Mm -hmm. OK. I think. Uh... The topological issue is sort of uh, yeah I, I really agree on the, uh, on this point. So I think that the topological issue uh, can potentially be leveraged here. It can think uh, intuitively understanding that uh, it's my understanding as the following. So if you think about topological changes in just three D shapes, it could be like very discontinuous, right? A shape is either like one hole or zero hole, so that's a discrete one. But in a higher dimensional space. You will be able to put a bunch of shades with no holes, genus zero to genus one, in a continual four D domain. And what we are doing here is like we are not uh, we are not only embedding in just high dimensional space, we are embedding in the super high dimensional space, like the neural parameters. So in the if we are navigating through the neural parameters, maybe there is a certain path where this topological change are smooth. And uh, our ways to get to it is through optimization. So this is my general understanding of why potentially neural field could be a um, uh, can be easier with the topological issues. So because in the intrinsic representation of it is the parameters, which is much much higher dimensional space. Okay. Yeah, we getting into some high dimensional statistics and uh, well if we yeah i don't know if we're in high dimensions i'm i'm just going with i have no clue what's happening um and won't trust any intuitions but yeah okay um any other comments further comments 
I think this has been one like a really great discussion so far. But I don't want to cut it off um, if there if it can continue. But if not, then I think it's also a very very strong finish for this discussion. So let's maybe do that. And yeah, thank you, uh, Guandao, for for your awesome paper, for the, the awesome discussion and answering all of our questions. Yeah. And for for noticeably putting a lot of effort into um, preparing a very nice presentation, although maybe this wasn't necessarily just for this uh, this event. And I think you've given similar presentations a few times already. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's really my honor and pleasure to uh, discuss with everyone. So I hope that uh, my uh, my presentation and discussion will kind of help so, uh, clarify some questions, raising some more such that we can uh, push this research direction forward. I'm also looking for collaborations. Uh, anyone's uh, interested in doing neural field on to model geometry physics, uh, let me know. I'm happy to um, chat more about that. Okay, that was definitely another great discussion. And if you want to join another great discussion yourself, you can do that every Tuesday. All of the information is down in the description where there's also links to our social media or to our Slack channel or to our mailing list where you'll get weekly updates on the next paper.